Welcome to another Regimed video. And in this video, we'll be talking about the advanced life support of a patient in the prone position whilst on a normal general ward. If you have a look at my last video, we talked about the new ICS Intensive Care Society guidelines on how to get patients who are self-ventilating to prone themselves and then change positions to see whether that improves their oxygenation, especially in the context of this COVID pandemic. However, it begs the question that if these patients are quite unwell and in the prone position, they do run the risk of actually developing a cardiac arrest whilst in the prone position. As it stands, I couldn't find much in the way of information or guidelines in how to manage patients in the prone position on the ward. And as such, this video is really a discussion of how to approach these patients and certainly what I have thought about in my own clinical practice as a way forward to manage these patients. But I'll be very grateful for the Resource Council and Intensive Care Societies to develop some more formalised guidelines. However, in the absence of that, what I'll be talking about is the main things to consider about when managing patients with cardiac arrests whilst in the prone position or in a ward setting. A suggested protocol for how to approach these ward patients who have had cardiac arrests in the prone position and some special considerations about the prone position. Now, coming at this from the perspective of both an intensivist and also uh, an anaesthetist, we've we fairly commonly prone patients for severe respiratory failure or in anaesthetics for operations on the spine, so for neurosurgery or for orthopaedic surgery. So we do have some experience and some protocols of which I will be using and adapting for the case of the ward patient who arrests in the prone position. Now, before we go any further, I think it's really vital to actually understand the key principle of CPR. And the Resource Council um, came up with this notion of the chain of survival. And I think this is really important. Early recognition and calling for help <clears throat> and early defibrillation. Now, if you remember from my uh, video on advanced life support in COVID and what the Resource Council has done in terms of an update for the ALS algorithm, you will remember that CPR is only started once, patient, once people, staff members, have appropriate levels of personal protective equipment. And therefore, there may be a delay in CPR. But certainly early defibrillation, there's a lot of evidence that that does work, even in patients who have out-of-hospital cardiac arrests where there's poor bystander CPR. If we can cardiovert them back into a rhythm with an output, if they're in VF or VT, that'll certainly improve their chances of getting a meaningful recovery. So... What this really focuses on is early defibrillation and a consideration of how to do CPR in these patients who are prone with also the potential complicating factor of being either a confirmed or suspected COVID patient. And again, I think it's pretty safe to say that we should be approaching every single patient who arrests in hospital and probably even outside of hospital as a potential COVID positive patient. So talking to people who aren't used to dealing with patients who are prone, they often say that you can't do CPR in the prone position and that they should turn the patient over. Well, that's actually false. It is possible to do CPR in patients who are prone. And actually, there's quite good evidence that it works quite well. There was a case series of 22 patients, albeit these were patients in theatre being monitored with an anaesthetist in place and an advanced airway already in place. However, out of the 22 patients who um, arrested on the theatre table, 10 survived to discharge, and that was by doing purely prone CPR. And there have been studies, there was an interesting CT study where they looked at 100 CT chests, um, where they looked at where the best place to perform CPR on the back was. Now, essentially, what this means is between the scapulae, between the shoulder blades. If you put your hands anywhere there, you're probably going to be all right. Ideally, you want to be in that 
sort of lower part which corresponds to the lower um, third of the sternum. But effectively, the middle, you aren't going to go wrong. Now, a lot of the initial papers talked about doing external counter pressure. Now, what that is, is if you imagine the patient is on their back like this, if you start doing CPR, can you see how the chest is just hanging down? So all you'll be doing is just moving the whole body downwards. So the initial studies all talked about putting a, a th second person, putting their hand on the sternum, and then as the person pushes down, they push up. So it squashes the left ventricle and the right ventricle here, and so it allows for appropriate um, forward flow of blood. Now you can see that one of the main reasons for doing this is that the chest is hanging free. What I would suggest is on the ward especially, often when they're lying, they may be lying flat on the bed, or they may have a pillow across the chest. If they have a pillow across the chest, I would suggest just simply removing that, getting the patient onto the bed, accepting that there is going to be some flex of the bed, but that's probably no different to if they were on their, um, in the supine position, and just doing CPR that way. If you can and you've got the spare people, it might be worth doing some sternal um, counter pressure. However, I wouldn't really do that to, with too much effort because I think there are other things that we can do that will really improve the patient's outcome beyond the sternal counter pressure. But if you've got the free people, it might be worth having this person put to hand, slip it underneath the chest, feel for the sternum, and then every time you feel the chest being pushed down by the person performing CPR, you push upwards so as to squash the heart in between the two. The other really important thing to consider is if you get called to a cardiac arrest in a patient who's prone, where do you put the pads? Now there's really good evidence actually that if you put a pad on the back and usually, so this is the patient's right side, this is the patient's left side, and you put it on the right-hand side of the spine, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side of the spine, with the other one in the left axillary um, area, you will give pretty good defibrillation energy to the heart. And that is actually quite effective, and certainly in theatres, when it has been used, it has cardioverted patients back to a normal sinus rhythm. The top picture here just shows roughly where to put your hands. And really, if you can see the scapulae here, we're putting it in between the two. And that's the right place to put it. You don't want to go too high because then you'll be pressing down on the neck. You don't want to go too low because then you'll miss the heart altogether. There is another option to having the pads on the back. So on the left hand side of the spine and in the left axillary. And that is the so-called bi-axillary or side-to-side -side placement. This is basically where you put it between each axilla and the electricity passes through. Now, it's not as efficient as having the posterior pad and then an axillary pad. Because if you imagine, it's got to go through a lot more lung tissue, a lot more air, and so the conductance isn't as great. This is a much better position if you can do it. But if for any reason you can't, a side-to-side -side position is a good backup. Now, the reason I show this is this particular patient is actually intubated, but you can imagine a ward patient being in a similar position. And what I want to emphasise here is these pillows. And you can see them here in the patient before they have got on the bed to be proned. These are the pillows that you need to pull out. So whenever there is a cardiac arrest and you want to perform CPR on them in the prone position, you must f have two people. The first person needs to hold the patient up a little bit, and the second patient needs to pull this, um, pull the pillows out. Ideally, you need a third person just to stabilise the head as well. If you don't, then what you're doing by just doing the chest compressions is all of the compression force will be taken up by the pillows and so the actual effectiveness of the CPR will be diminished. If patients are on an IV, 
My personal thought is if they're that sick that they're requiring auto-proning, self-proning, they should probably have an end-tidal CO2 trace on the NIV. And it's important to have that because what you can see here is classically what happens when a cardiac arrest happens. You will see the end-tidal CO2 being good, and then slowly it diminishes down and down and down. And the reason for that is that the um, patient has got a reduction in their cardiac output. And that's as the blood pressure drops, and then eventually the patient will arrest. If they have a sudden cardiac arrest, they may just stop breathing, in which case with NIV, you'll just see it stop. That is very different to the patient who is invasively ventilated. And have a look at my video on um, CPR in the prone position for the ITU patient, where we talk about the ventilated patient. But it's just important to notice that this is slightly different in NIV, which you might see in the ward setting, compared to the intubated patient, where this bottom graph would actually indicate that the patient has extubated rather than there being a diminishing um, cardiac output. Now, I'd really recommend going and having a look at my video on um, the advanced life support algorithm and the update that the Resus Council has done in face of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the principles are simply, you call for help first before touching the patient. You don't assess for signs of life, you just call for help. Any contact with a patient must be with some level of personal protective equipment. To apply the pads and to shock the patient, and to check for um, a pulse, you must at the very minimum have level 2 PPE. And if you're going to perform CPR, then everyone in the room must have a minimum of level 3 PPE. So what is level 2 PPE? Level 2 PPE is essentially what most um, doctors and nurses on the wards have on. This is a surgical face mask some form of eye protection as goggles or visor, gloves, and a long-sleeved waterproof gown. That is adequate for putting the pads on the patient, assessing rhythm and shocking them. It is adequate for feeling a pulse. It is not adequate for CPR. And you must not be in the room if you've only got a surgical face mask if the patient is having CPR. Level 3 personal protective equipment is far more robust. The most important portion of this is the um, FFP3 or N95 mask. This will filter out viral particles. When you start doing CPR, we consider that an aerosol generating procedure. And then the other bits of uh, the personal protective equipment is a full face shield, a surgical gown or another kind of waterproof gown, one or probably two sets of gloves, a face uh, a hat for the hair, and either wipe clean shoes or covers for shoes. And that is the bare minimum before you start CPR. And as you can imagine, this is going to take a bit of time for the arrest team to put on when they arrive at the point of the cardiac arrest. So let's think about the ward patient. Now, what will happen is that on the nurses' rounds, they might notice that the patient is not responsive or that they're not breathing. The first response of the nurse should be to call the, uh, push the call um, buzzer and to prompt someone to call the arrest number, which in the UK is 2222, state that there's a cardiac arrest and the ward and the bed number of that cardiac arrest. The other thing that the crash call buzzer will, should prompt is that someone should immediately bring the defibrillator to the bed space. Now, they should not go to the patient or attach the patient or touch the patient unless they have level 2 PPE, which is the surgical face mask, eye protection and a gown with gloves. As soon as a nurse or a doctor has at least that level 2 PPE, they can feel for a pulse or look for signs of life, 
But the main thing is to attach the pads. And like I say, if they're in the prone position, probably the best thing to do is to do one on the left side of the spine in between the shoulder blades and the other pad in the axillary portion of the um, on the left side. And if failing that, a biaxillary um, pad placement if the patient, for example, has a big pressure sore on their back. If they've got nasal specs or face mask on, put it on 15 litres via non-rebreathe. If they have NIV, do not take it off until someone with level 3 PPE is there. But it's probably worth getting that NIV off early. But do not take it off until you've got level 3 PPE. If, however, you've just got um, a face mask on, turn the oxygen up to 15 litres or change it over to a 15 litre non-rebreathe mask. The reason it's worth early consideration of taking off the NIV is that when you start CPR, these patients can aspirate. And if you've got a tight-fitting mask with positive pressure, you can then develop a quite significant aspiration pneumonia. But I reiterate, if you've got level 2, then do not take that NIV off. Only if you've got level 3 should you put take the um, NIV mask off. And once you've attached the pads and they've assessed, what you want to do is you want to um, shock if they've got VT or VF. Instead of moving the oxygen off the patient, just switch it off from the flow meter, shock, and then you can turn the oxygen back on if you want. With PEA or asystole, this is where it's slightly different to the normal CPR ALS algorithm. These nurses or doctors are likely only to have level 2 PPE. Now if they do, you're not going to be able to start CPR because only people with level 3 PPE are going to be able to start um, CPR. You're going to need the viral filter mask. So, you've got a bit of time to wait. So what you can do during this time, whilst you're waiting for the resource team to come, or waiting for someone to don the full level 3 PPE, is that you can turn the patient over. Now, I would suggest that you need a minimum of three people, likely five people. You need one person to hold the head, so that whilst they're turning, the head doesn't flop around and you need one person at least on either side of the patient. How do you turn the patient? So the most important thing is having a bed sheet. And so this is why I think it's really important on the crash trolley, on the wards, especially if you're proning patients, to have a spare bed sheet. And with that bed sheet, you cover the patient's back, leaving their head and neck exposed so that the person at the head end can hold on to that. You put it over the patient and then you wrap it up like a pasty with the lower bed sheet. So now it's nice and tight on either side. And then you move the patient over one side so that when you turn the patient over, they've got all of this bed to fall onto. So move them across and then you can turn them over. And you can see here that they're turning the patient over. You can see that's quite a lot of work. And even with three people, it can be quite difficult. Ideally, you need all five people there to make it an easy job. And patients are quite heavy, so they can be difficult to turn over easily. So a few things. What do you do if the patient's on NIV? or CPAP. Well, personally, I would take these patients off the NIV or CPAP. The reason for this is once you do start CPR on them, 
there's a high likelihood that gastric contents will move up into the oropharynx. And if it does, they can aspirate. And with positive pressure, they can aspirate really quite peripherally in the lungs and cause a very bad aspiration pneumonitis. However, before you take the NIV off, you must have level 3 PPE on and anyone with level 2 must leave because they you are likely to aerosolize a lot of virus by taking the NIV mask off. I would suggest taking it off before you start CPR. Now you're going to have to have level 3 um, PPE on to start CPR so it's the ideal time to take it off. Um, and for the face, uh, full face masks, I definitely suggest it. I don't have experience with CPAP hoods. I suspect with CPAP hoods, there's less of a chance of there being a significant aspiration given that there's a much bigger space for the um, gastric contents to fall out of. But even so, personally, I would feel much happier putting a 15 litre non rebreathe mask on because you can empty that out easily it's a lot looser fitting so the um, secretions can dribble out the sides high flow nasal cannulae personally i would keep them on however there is an argument that you could take them out because you do cause quite a lot of pneumatic splinting of the um, upper airways and so you could increase the risk of you developing an aspiration but personally, I would keep them on. But you could arguably take it off and put a 15 litre non rebreathe mask on, even if they're on high flow. What do you do if you don't have enough people to turn the patient? Now, it might be that um, you don't have enough people on the ward or um, that there's not, ev not everyone is dressed in PPE. The, what I would suggest is that the first member of staff who comes in with level 3 PPE, the first thing that they do is that they get either the person with level 2 PPE who's attached the pads on or an, the other people that are around to remove the pillows behind below the chest, then to step out. So only someone with level 3 PPE is at the bedside in the patient's bay. And then you could start CPR. If there is a second person with level 3 PP, they could provide that sternal counter pressure. But like I say, I think making things practical, it's probably easier just to do the CPR and um, avoid the sternal counter pressure. There are papers suggesting that that may be adequate. When you start the CPR, just before you do it, you've obviously checked for a rhythm. It's a non-shockable rhythm. Give the adrenaline one milligram IV 10 mil mini jet straight away and then start CPR. The CPR you should be put doing between the shoulder blades. Don't give any breaths. So this is cardiac massage only. You don't stop until the, C the full resus team has come. Continue until the resus team has come or if there are enough people with level 3 PPE on who can turn the patient. Once CPR has started, only people with level 3 PPE can get in. Do not let anyone else come in, even if they're well-meaning and want to try and help to turn the patient. Once CPR has started, it is an aerosol generating procedure and you, will, you have to assume that there is virus in the air. Now, before you turn the patient, if you've been doing CPR for a while, it is worth checking the rhythm before you turn, because sometimes you can throw a patient back into, into VT or VF, and if you have, then shock them and see if you can get them back into a rhythm. Once they're supine, you just follow exactly the same ALS algorithm as you would normally. Often you would have had to do CPR for a while and so that three minute time would have been up so you can repeat your adrenaline once the patient is supine and I'd suggest doing it because often you wouldn't have a timer there at the time that you start CPR because you'd probably be the only person there in the room or one of only two people there and then start your ALS algorithm from the top to bottom.
As soon as you've turned the patient, again, it's worth checking the rhythm before you um, restart the CPR. And then go through your four H's and four T's as usual. Um, the other slight difference to the normal ALS algorithm is it's probably worth um, early intubation if you think that this is a salvageable situation. But to be honest, if they've been in the prone position, there's been a delay to CPR and they're in a non-shockable rhythm, they have a very low chance that they're going to survive the cardiac arrest. So in summary, the th key things I want you to take away from this is you can do CPR in the prone position. You must do that with level 3 um, PPE on, but you can do it. You don't have to turn the patient over. Do not approach the patient without appropriate PPE. Level 2 if you're going to put the pads on and shock the patient, and level 3 for everything else. Early defibrillation is important. That is not in itself an aerosol generating procedure and it can be done with just level 2 PPE on. But that is the only thing really that you'll be doing as an intervention for this patient. If they do have NIV or CPAP on, it's worth thinking about it. My personal preference is to take it off and to take it off you would switch off the oxygen, switch off the machine and then take it off and put a 15 litre non-rebreathed mask on and then before any shocks switch off the oxygen from the wall. And the reason for taking those um, CPAP NIV masks off is that if they're tight fitting and the patient vomits or gets, asp or gets regurgitation of gastric contents into the oropharynx they are likely to have a significant aspiration. I hope that's been useful. The next uh, video that I'll be doing is on how to approach the cardiac arrest patient on the intensive care unit who's intubated and ventilated, who is also in the prone position. This is a bit more familiar for people who are in the intensive care, but for those who are new to intensive care, it's probably worth going through it just to have an idea of how to approach that situation if it were to occur. If you found this video useful, please like and subscribe to the channel. I'll be producing lots of videos in the coming months, um, which will hopefully be quite useful for anyone new or old to intensive care. Thank you very much.